You know, it seems like every organization is moving towards a microservices based architecture. And I get it. There's a lot of benefits to using microservices, but every virtue can turn into a vice if it's taken to the extreme. So for every benefit of microservices, there's some disadvantages as well. Hi, I'm Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor in chief over at theserverside.com. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the pros and cons of developing with microservices. But before we do that, we kind of have to figure out exactly what a microservice is. And it doesn't have a great definition. There's no standards organization that will stamp your application and say it definitely is a microservice. There's guidelines. One of those guidelines is the fact that a microservice should be built according to the 12-factor app. There's a link in the description if you want to learn more about the 12-factor app, but it says that microservices should be stateless. They should have their dependencies isolated. They should map to their own Git repository. Those are just three of the 12 guidelines. To me, something really is a microservice if it can be packaged in a container like Docker or Podman and deployed into an orchestration system like Kubernetes and run as the application was designed. That's another piece of criteria. It certainly is the opposite of the types of applications we built 15, 20 years ago using servlets and JSPs and maybe three-tier architectures where every part of our website used the front-end layer, which interacted with the common middle-tier layer, which interacted with the common data-tier layer. Microservices are very much the opposite of that. So what are some of the benefits of working with a microservices and building a microservices architecture? What are the benefits of that over a monolithic architecture? And also, what are some of the drawbacks? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, one of the ideas behind building a microservice-based architecture instead of a monolithic one is that you're going to create a number of small, independent, isolated applications that will communicate with each other at runtime using RESTful APIs and JSON as a data exchange format. That creates a loosely coupled application, and that's certainly always been a high goal of service-oriented architectures. However, there's a drawback to all of this networking, all of this REST and all of this JSON, and that's that it's slow. It creates a lot of network chattiness, and there's a lot of extra CPU cycles that have to go into creating JSON, sending it across a network, and then parsing it on the other side of the network. Contrast that against a monolithic application where it's all running on one server. We don't have to create JSON files. We don't have to use the network. We get incredible efficiency running right on the CPU. That's why when we have real-time applications, we often prefer a monolithic type of approach than a microservice-based one that won't perform quite as well. Now, another benefit of creating a lot of independent, loosely coupled applications that get deployed in their own container is the fact that each of them can be written in their own language. These microservices are language, arguably architecture neutral. You can design them and build them using whatever language you want. That allows you to use Go or Rust if it makes sense for a particular use case, and then maybe use Python or Java for other use cases. That's a big benefit. It's also a drawback because that now means that you're going to be managing, maintaining software that's built in a variety of different languages. And who knows if six months, eight months, a year's time, you're going to have those skills on your team to manage those applications that were built in JavaScript or Python six months ago. Microservices are supposed to be domain driven and singularly focused. That means they're typically easily developed by small teams, five, six developers, certainly 10 or less, which is very much in line with modern agile frameworks like Scrum and XP, which say you should never have a development team with more than 10 people on it. So that's a key benefit of microservice-based development. It really fits in with modern agile team-based development frameworks. Now, the drawback to that is a lot of organizations, especially big enterprises, pay a lot of lip service to Agile, but they really haven't made that Agile transition. And forcing a waterfall model on the development of microservices isn't always a great fit. And that's a 
big drawback and maybe just a big challenge in moving from monolithic application development into the world of modern microservices. Now, everybody loves Apache, everybody loves Eclipse, everybody loves open source software. I certainly do. One of the great things about microservices is that they're typically developed and certainly deployed using open source software like Docker, Podman, and Kubernetes. That's fantastic, but there's drawbacks. And one of the big drawbacks is that if you want to actually put a full featured enterprise microservices based architecture into play, you've got to bring together a patchwork of different products. Simple example, if you're using Kubernetes and Docker, you know, there's no real logging framework that comes with it out of the box. There's no real monitoring framework that comes out of the box with Kubernetes and Docker. So you have to patch together Fluentd and Kibana and Elasticsearch and all of these other tools to get monitoring and log aggregation and graphing to all work together. So you end up with a patchwork of technology. So it's great that we're open source, but in the end, when we actually go into deployment, we often have to go to a vendor and ask that vendor to come help us out, give us their implementation of a Kubernetes, Docker type of deployment that's got all of those extra little features that you need to support enterprise deployment already pre-configured for us. So it's a benefit that it's open source, but the reality is we often need the help of a vendor to get cloud-based microservices to really work. And so there you go. That's a high level overview of some of the benefits and drawbacks to microservices. Now, if you check out the description, there's a couple of links in there to some articles that I've written for the serverside.com that go more in depth about the pros and cons of microservices. So I really encourage you to go and check those out. By the way, I'm the editor in chief over at the serverside.com. We got great set of articles on Git, on DevOps, on microservices, on Spring, on Agile, on Scrum. So please head over to the server side and check it out. If you're interested in my personal antics, you can always follow me on Twitter at CameronMCNZ. And I'd also encourage you to subscribe on YouTube.